Welcome to the Genealogy Radio Show, the radio show that's keeping you in the loop. And this week's show is all about the fascinating subject of the GAA. And we also have a follow on show next week because we wouldn't have been able to cover the GAA with just one show. Now we have Nicholas, who's going to be doing the interviewing for the Genealogy Wolves team and welcome to the show today. Hello. First on the show, we have Oshin. Oshin, could you please tell us a little bit about the GAA and the Gaelic Revival? The Gaelic Athletics Association, abbreviated to GAA, is a well-known organisation. Uh, from the largest Irish cities and their great stadiums to the littlest village with their local pitch, most know a name or two of the founding members, but everyone knows the GAA's mission, the protection and the prosperity of native Irish sport. And so they made rules for the sports and organized matches and tournaments like the Chalcha Games held back during the Irish Free State, and also as a revival of the ancient tournaments that occurred between Irish kingdoms upon the sacred Tara Hill, beneath the gaze of the High King of Ireland. This tradition became lost for hundreds of years due to the Norman Conquest, but the GAA resurrected it. Hurling is the best known Gaelic sport, popular among the Irish diaspora in mainland Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Argentina, and South Korea. UNESCO lists hurling as heritage. The consensus of experts today tells of hurling being 1400 years old, since legends of Fionn McCullum and the even more relevant Cú Cullen go back to the year 1200 BC. The earliest written records of hurling go back to the copy of the ancient Breton laws of the 400s. Another written record of hurling would be a law called the Statute of Galway in 1527, which mentioned Gaelic football and archery, saying both were legal. But the Statute of Galway ironically made hurling illegal. There exist references to Gaelic football as far back as 1308. There was a legal record describing how John McCroken apparently stabbed a player, Mr. William Bernard, by accident. This was in Newcastle, South Dublin, and the field is known to this day as the football field. In the 1600s, football became very popular due to the wealthy gentry class funded games. Each landlord would make a team from 20 of the tenants on their land, and the two gents would often bet 100 guineas, which in today's prices would be around 6,000 euros. Football was banned at times as well. In 1695, anyone caught playing on a Sunday would be fined. The first ever inter-county match uh, was between Louth and Mead on a Sunday in 1712. That match is immortalised forever in a poem of 88 verses by James Dahl McCartan. Six aside was played in Dublin at this time. In Kerry in the 1800s, we have two types of football recorded, what referred to as cad, a word rarely used today. A local priest describes the two, with one, pretty basic, get the ball between the two posts. The other was an epic cross-country game that took a whole day and ended with one team had gotten the ball, run it through the other team, dodging tackles and holes, and they kept going until they reached the border of the parish. Although some groups like Limerick's own commercial clubs tried to organize football, it was in its worst state of any Irish sport when the GAA was founded. Other games like Rounders, although it may actually be English, was first organized by the GAA. The GAA has its origins in the late 19th century on the back heels of a momentous cultural realignment in Ireland known as the Gaelic Revival. The revival was a national movement in Ireland which sought to revive interests in Irish culture, such as language, sport, literature, music, and arts to the general population. Its presence stemmed from the concern in the late 19th century that the Irish language, along with the aforementioned properties of Irish culture, were being diminished by the dominance of the English language, which was, and still is, the primary language spoken in Ireland, with Irish as a daily language spoken between peoples being relegated to a collection of remote rural communities in the west of Ireland. Many organizations were set up across the century, showing a growing enthusiasm for the rejuvenation of the Irish culture. From the Ulster Gaelic Society, the Society of the Preservation of the Irish Language, and the Gaelic League, of which prominent scholars and historical figures took part in. Douglas Hyde, the first president of Ireland, was a member of the Gaelic League, and also its first elected president. At the National Literary Society in 1892, Hyde gave a lecture titled, The Necessity for De-Anglicising Ireland, in which he emphasizes the importance of the Irish language to the Irish character in the face of an Anglicized society from British colonialism on Ireland. This sentiment was followed up in the Gaelic Journal, a journal which was dedicated to the promotion and cultivation of the living Irish language. 
While the Irish language was the binding axiom for all participants in the Gaelic revival, many focused on different properties of Irish culture to promote to the general public. For instance, Annie Patterson, an Irish musical writer and composer, headed the Fez Call or Musical Fe Festival of Music, which was tasked with the promotion of traditional Irish folk music. Another prominent member and the founder of the subject of this discussion, Michael Cusack, founded the GAA, seeking to promote indigenous as well as conventional sport, which encompassed the essence of active pastimes for Ireland. Thanks for that, Oshin. That was very interesting. Next up, we have Keane. Charles Stuart Parnell was a patron founder of the GAA. Could you tell me a little bit about his life and career? Charles Stuart Parnell was born on the 27th of June, 1846, to an Anglo-Irish Protestant landowning family in County Wicklow. Charles Stuart Parnell came from a predominantly Protestant family. He studied at the Magdalen College in Cambridge from 1865 to 1869. However, due to financial troubles at the time, he never completed his degree. In 1874, he became the High Sheriff of Wicklow, which gave him many judicial, electoral, ceremonial and administrative functions, and he also executed high court writs. While landlord, he opened many opportunities for industrialization in South Wicklow. Charles had a keen interest in Isaac Butts Home Rule League, which was an Irish political party that campaigned to have home rule and self-government for Ireland under the ruling of Great Britain. Charles tried to run for the House of Commons twice, in 1873 and 1874, but failed. In an article written by Kevin Haddock Flynn in 2005, he stated that he believes that Charles's reason for joining the cause was his implacable hostility towards England. Historian AJP Taylor claimed, more than any other man, he gave Ireland the sense of being an independent nation. Charles Stuart Parnell was first elected to the House of Commons in the April 1875 Meath by-election and joined the Irish Parliamentary Party led by Isaac Butt. Parnell was then only 29 years old. In 1879, Parnell became president of the newly established Land League, founded by another early GAA patron, Michael Davitt. The main aims of the Land League were to provide tenants with the three Fs, fair rent, fixed tenure, and free sale of property. The Land League's popularity skyrocketed almost overnight. By 1882, Parnell was the undisputed leader of the Irish nationalist movement and the uncrowned King of Ireland. In March 1882, then British Prime Minister William Gladstone and Parnell came to an agreement in what became known as the Kilmainham Treaty, in which all political prisoners, including Parnell, were released after being arrested the previous year and land reform began. When the Land League was replaced by the National Land League in December 1882, Parnell ensured it was under the control of the Irish Parliamentary Party. By 1884, he was so powerful that he was able to impose a pledge on party members. In the 1885 general election, the IPP won every constituency in Ireland except for the Unionist constituencies of Eastern Ulster and Dublin University. In 1887, the Times of London published an article accusing Parnell and other leaders in the, of the national movement of their involvement in murder during the land war in the early 1880s. In one of the letters, Parnell excused T.H. Burke's murder who was murdered alongside Lord Cavendish in Phoenix Park in 1882. Despite claiming the letter was forged, a special commission was set up to investigate Parnell and the IPP. In February 1889, a witness admitted forging the letters and fled to Madrid, where he committed suicide. 
Parnell's name was cleared. The end of 1889 saw him receive a standing ovation in the House of Commons, awarded the freedom of the city of Edinburgh, and stayed at Gladstone's home in Howarden. However, in December 1889, Parnell was named in the divorce proceedings of Captain O'Shea. Back in 1880, Parnell fell in love with Captain O'Shea's wife, Catherine, and they were living together by 1886. This divorce caused commotion in the British Isles. When Parnell refused to resign as leader of the IPP, a massive divide occurred in the party, with 27 members supporting Parnell and 44 members believing he should resign as leader. In the 1891 by-elections, his candidates lost in every constituency, signalling the end of his reign. In 1884, during the meeting at the founding of the GAA, Charles Stuart Parnell was asked to be and subsequently became a patron of the GAA alongside Archbishop Croke and Michael Daggett. I will now hand over. Thank you very much for that, Keane. Uh, next up, we have Connor. Michael Cusack is often considered the leading founder of the GAA, but what have you learned about his career pre and post the formation of the GAA? Michael Cusack was born in the parish of Carron on the eastern edge of the Burren in County Clare on the 20th of September, 1847. He grew up in an Irish-speaking household, not learning to speak English until he was 11 years old. Little else is known regarding his childhood other than the fact he grew up hurling and doing athletics on Sundays after Mass. This may have led to his love of the game and desire to revive it in the future. Michael Cusack was a teacher in Black Rock and Nicola County Colleges before setting up the Civil Service Academy in Dublin, also known as Cusack's Academy. Notable here is that Cusack established a hurling club in the school. Unfortunately, however, his teaching career would be left at the wayside as he gradually got more involved as a sports journalist and critic. Cusack was a skilled athlete and a shot put champion, but he was critical of the organized games being controlled by the Protestant establishment. In 1881, he suggested that the organizers of rugby and athletics quote, allow a strip of green across their colors. Cusick believed that hurling, football, and the Irish language were an, an essential component of Irish culture. Cusack, with Morris Davin, arranged a meeting in Hayes Hotel Thurlis in order to form the GAA, an organization with the aim of reviving hurling and Gaelic football. The day of the meeting was the 1st of November, 1884, as a date significant in Celtic mythology as the date when the Fianna's power died. Cusack and Davin met up with five other individuals passionate about the continuation of sports such as hurling and football in Ireland. These men were John Wise Power, John McKay, J.K. Bracken, Thomas St. George McCarthy, and Joseph O'Ryan. It was later reported that six other men were said to be in attendance. Davin was elected president and Cusack became the secretary of the GA. Thomas Croke, the Archbishop of Cashel, became the organization's first patron, with Michael Davitt and Charles Parnell following suit as patrons. Cusack was reportedly not easy to get along with, despite being an excellent organizer in the first few months of setting up the, the association. He had not remained secretary of the GAA for long, being forced to resign 18 months after the association was founded due to him failing to submit accounts for auditing. However, even with, without the guidance of Cusack, the Gaelic Athletic Association began to evolve and spread continuously. In 1886, Committees for each county were set up that became the face of representation for the All-Ireland Championships, which were newly introduced. As the organization became more popular, the organization drew up new rules for both hurling and football and published them in the United Irishman newspaper. The GAA held its first All-Ireland Championships for both Gaelic football and hurling in 1887, three years after the formation of the organization. Backing from patrons such as the Archbishop of Cashel, influenced by the religion of the founder Michael Cusick, shows the power that the Catholic Church had during that time. Thank you, Connor, for that. Uh, to conclude, we have Laura. In your findings, what have you discovered in relation to Archbishop Croke and how the influence of Catholicism impacted the creation of the GAA? Thomas William Croke was more than just the first patron of the Gaelic Athletic Association. He was a symbol of the Catholic grip over Ireland in the 1800s. The ideals of setting up a national gaming league without Catholic patrons was not even considered. Thomas Croke was born on the 28th of May, 1824 in County Cork. He was one of eight children of William Croke, an estate agent and wealthy farmer, and his wife, Isabella Plummer. 
Isabella was a daughter of an aristocratic Protestant family who subsequently disowned her after her marriage to a Catholic man. Despite this, Isabella raised her children as devout Catholics with five of her eight children, including Thomas Croke, opting for a life devoted to God and the service of the Catholic Church. The surname Croke is a rare name. The Crokes were in County Kilkenny since the early 14th century. How and when they spread to North Cork is not known, but the family to which the Archbishop belonged were comfortable farmers and people of influence in their neighbourhood. One of his uncles, the very Reverend Thomas Croke, was a parish priest of Charleville for over 40 years. Thomas Croke received an enriched education. After his father, William, died in 1834, his uncle, the Reverend Thomas Croke, supervised his education and upbringing. Thomas received schooling in Charleville County Cork, as well as the Irish College in Paris, and then completed his studies for the priesthood in the Irish College in Rome. He was one of the most distinguished class to be awarded the degree of divinity in 1846, winning gold and silver medals. He sold these medals, giving the proceeds toward the towards the relief of the terrible havoc caused by the Great Famine. Upon his return to Ireland, he became a member of the Irish hierarchy with the title Archbishop of Cashel in 1875. Archbishop Croke was a strong supporter of Irish nationalism, aligning himself with the Irish National Land League during the Land War and with the chairman of the Irish Parliamentary Party, Charles Stuart Parnell. He opposed the No Rent Manifestos in 1881 and argued for no tax to be implemented on Irish land by British in 1887. Of course, this significant clergyman is best remembered worldwide today when the name Croke Park is mentioned. Ireland's premier sporting venue is named in honour of Archbishop Croke and is often called Croker by some GAA fans and locals. It serves both as the principal stadium and headquarters of the Gaelic Athletic Association. Upon establishing the GAA, Michael Cusack was aware of the need to integrate the support of the Catholic Church, thus contacted Archbishop Croke to serve as a patron. Croke dutifully accepted the role and thus was one of the men who met in the Billards Room in Hayes' Hotel in Thurles in 1884. The aims were set out to foster and promote native Irish pastimes, to open athletics to all social classes, to aid in the establishment of hurling and football clubs, which would organise matches between counties. On March 15, 1896, the first All Ireland finals were played at Jones's Road. The delayed 1895 All-Ireland Hurling final was played in 1896 when Tipperary defeated Kilkenny, leading to a rivalry between these counties that never ceased to exist. The delayed 1895 All-Ireland football final saw Tipperary defeat Meath. Traditions soon began to form. One noted tradition was that the Archbishop threw in the ball at the start of the All-Ireland finals on both minor and senior level. This tradition lasted for many decades. Despite the Catholic Church's grip loosening around Irish culture, the tradition of the Archbishop being the leading patron of the GAA still exists today, with Archbishop Kieran O'Reilly standing as patron in the present day. Thomas Croke passed away on the 22nd of July in 1902. In 1913, Central Council decided to initiate the Croke Memorial Tournament to raise funds for a suitable monument to the GAA's first patron. The final of the tournament was played on the 4th of March, 1913, with Kerry facing Louth. So successful was this venture that not alone could the association afford to finance a monument, but could think seriously of acquiring a new central sports ground. When all expenses had been met, Central Council had made £2,365. On the 27th of July, 1913, Central Council decided to buy ground situated on Jones's Road in Dublin and rename it as Croke Memorial Park. The grounds were sold to the GEA for £3,500 and Croke Park became the principal grounds of the association and its administrative headquarters. Thank you all for that really interesting piece on the history of the GEA and its founders. It really is a fascinating topic and it's important in terms of the history of Ireland and as stated earlier cannot be covered just in one show. Uh, and I think that brings us to the end of this show. I'd like to thank Oshin, Keen, Connor and Laura for representing the Genealogy Wolves here today. Thank you to everyone for listening to today's show. The show will be repeated on Sunday on Radio Corkabashkin.